Hi everybody, okay, welcome back. We're looking today at the subject of participles. We're building on the previous video where I introduced the topic of participles, so go back and check that one out if you haven't done so so far. Today what we're going to look at is found in Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek, section 7.4.3, Participles with Objects. We're on pages 86 and 87. Now Duff as ever has got a great little explanation here, and I just want to uh, fill that out for you a little bit. He writes, quote, because the participle is a verb, it can have its own object in the accusative. This isn't complicated once you get the hang of it. Well, he's right. It's not complicated once you get the hang of it. Um, if you uh, imagine a, the sentence, actually, let's use the sentence that he's got here. Um, I'll give you the English because I've not written the Greek on the board. These are two examples which we'll look at in a second. When he saw the crowd, Jesus proclaimed the word. Or uh, if you wanted a more of a basic gloss translation, it's seeing the crowd, Jesus proclaimed the word. Now, the main clause, Jesus proclaimed the word. That's the subject verb object, Jesus proclaimed the word. You've then got a participial clause hanging off that, telling you something more about what Jesus is doing. And the thing he's doing, which is something more described by the participle, is seeing. So when he saw. And what is it that he's seeing? Well, it's when he saw the crowd. Jesus proclaimed the word, or seeing the crowd, Jesus proclaimed the word. So you notice that not only does the main verb have an object, Jesus proclaimed the word, but the participle, seeing, or when he saw, also has an object, when he saw the crowd. And the object of uh, that verb, the participle, goes in the accusative, just like the object of the main verb goes in the accusative. So if you're writing that in Greek, as Duff does, you've got two nouns in the accusative. And the thing that distinguishes them is their word order. Uh, the one that belongs to the participle is closer to the participle. And again, you can see that if you look at that example there. But I want to give you these examples here, which show much the same thing. And we're now at the top of page 87. I'm just going to go through them nice and quickly. And what I'm going to try and do is speed up through the stuff that you should have got the hang of by now um, because you've done it a little bit before the, the main verbs and so on. So we can focus on the participles. So let's go with this one. Question one. Anaxantestus ophthalmus auton eblepsan ten phalasan. I'll read it again. Anaxantestus ophthalmus auton eblepsan ten phalasan. Now, what's going on here? Well, as always, 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 the first thing you do is find the main verb. Eblepsan is the third person plural aorist of blepo. Uh, it comes from that stem. You see the sigma has made the pi into a psi, and you've got the epsilon augment at the beginning, so it's epsilon augment, sigma suffix, and then um, uh, it's a... a Third person plural ending, it's an, because it's elusa, elusas, elusen, elusamen, eliseta, elusan. So that means they saw. And then predictably you've got an object, because people don't just see normally, they see something uh, in the accusative, ten, thalasan. And of course that means one, two, three, yeah, it means they saw the sea. Okay, so that's the main, uh, I should have a resolution by the way, to... Um, Write legibly. There we are. How's that? They saw the sea. That's the main clause with the main verb. And now what you've got helpfully marked off that from that with a little comma there is a participial clause. That is a, a clause with a participle in it. Anoixantes tus ophthalmus auton. Now where's the participle in that? Well you should be able to recognise that ending because that is the aorist plural nominative masculine uh, ending for a participle, because you learned in the previous video, it's luon, luontes, lusas, lusantes. So the sigma has combined with the gamma at the end of the stem of anoigo. The gamma plus the sigma gives you a xi, so anoixantes, and this is um, aorist plural. Now, just a note on that. Why is it plural? Well, it's plural because it matches with the plural subject of the main verb. That's also the reason why it's nominative. They saw the sea. This is nominative because 
it is telling you something about this noun that's in the nominative. And as you know, at the moment you haven't learned accusative genitive dative participles, so the only participles that we're looking at are ones that modify the noun that's in the nominative, the subject of the main clause, which is they in this, this is the verb, obviously. Okay, so uh, anoigo means uh, I open. So um, if anoigo means I open, how do you gloss the meaning of an aorist participle? Well, for that, you need to look back at the previous page or check out the previous video. You remember that an aorist participle happened before, sorry, happens before the action of the main verb. A present participle happens at the same time as the main verb. So my recommendation to you is when you're first glossing a participle, that is, when you're first sketching out uh, something in English that represents roughly what it might mean, the best thing to do, if it's present, is simply to write, in this case, opening. Or if it's aorist, it's having opened. Having opened. So opening, or if it's luo, untying for the present, un having untied for the aorist. The reason for that is not because it will normally be the best translation when you come up with a finished sentence. The best translation will depend on more complex factors, like how this action relates to that one within the logic of the sentence. The reason for using something like having opened and opening is because it leaves open, no pun intended, the widest possible range of meanings. You don't want to uh, put something like something that constrains the meaning too tightly when you're first glossing a word. So having opened or opening leaves as wide as possible the range of meanings that a participle um, uh, could possibly have. And if you're watching this knowing something a little bit more about participles and how they function, you'll know exactly what I'm getting at there. Okay, so having opened, da -da -da, they saw the sea. So they opened their eyes, or uh, I'm giving the game away, <laughs> they opened something and then they saw the sea, okay? Now, here's the question, what's all this lot doing? The game that I've just given away is, this is the object of this participle. Just look at it closely, okay? How do you know? Well, uh, it's in the accusative. Tus, ophthalmus, comes from ophthalmos, which means an eye, as in this thing, thing you look with. Um, so the eyes, accusative plural, the eyes, our tone of them. So the eyes of them, the way we write that in English is, of course, their eyes. So what have we got then? Having opened their eyes, they saw the sea. So can you see how that works? It's quite brilliant and quite uh, elegant, really, that um, the aorist participle, just by translating it in this slightly mechanical way, having opened, neatly locates the action of this participle before that of the main verb. And of course, verbal participles only have meaning in relation to a main verb. So you translate the main verb first, and then this happens if it's aorist, it happens before the action of the main verb. Okay, so having opened their eyes, this is the new bit in section 7.4.3, that the participle can have an object as well as the main verb having an object. How do you tell which accusative goes with which verb? This accusative goes with this verb, this accusative goes with this participle, which is a kind of verb. Well, this is one of the few instances where word order really does start to become important for working out what goes with what. There are other ways um, that the word order will be structured or other conventions that will help you to, to avoid this theoretical confusion. But just for now, at the simple level with these sentences that we're working at at this stage, you can see that it's fairly obvious that this is going to go with that verb, their eyes is going to go with this verb, and the C is going to go with that, because the alternative would be that this goes with that, and this goes with what went before it, which would just be a bit strange um, in any language, Greek or English. So having opened their eyes, they saw the C. All good? Take a deep breath. Let's jump into number three. This is the third of the four examples you've got there from Jeremy Duff. Let's go green, environmental, as ever. All right. Um, Grapsas to biblion ho petros epempsen auto te ecclesia. I'll read it again just because it's good to practice the reading. Grapsas to biblion ho petros epempsen auto te ecclesia. Okay, so what do we do here? You tell me what we do here, what we always do whenever we get a new sentence. Thank you very much. We find the main verb, which is right there. 
a pimpson, aorist, third person singular from pempo. Pempo. Pause for a second. What on earth is the psi doing there when you had a pi at the end of the stem of pempo? Answer is, of course, same as what happened here. The sigma uh, suffix for the aorist has combined with the pi and made it into a psi. Because if you say p -s, you get a ps sound. So obviously that's going to happen. So this is the aorist, third person singular, because it's elusa, elusas, elusen, third person singular, meaning he sent. He sent. Right. So that's what we've got so far. That's the verb. Now, is there a subject? I didn't even mention it with this one, of course. There wasn't a subject because there was nothing, there was no noun in the nominative. Is there a noun in the nominative here? Yes, of course there is. Ho Petros, meaning Peter. Notice the presence of the article with a proper name. You don't always translate that in English, of course. You do occasionally get it in names of countries like the United Kingdom or um, the United States. But generally in Greek, you more often get um, the article Hophetos, God, Hopetros, Peter. So Peter sent. Right. What have we got now? Well, verb, subject, we want to find the object. Is there anything that's a noun in the accusative? The answer is yes, there is. This, which is interesting, that's a third person pronoun. Um, it could um, theoretically be nominative, um, but it's unlikely to be nominative, isn't it? Because you've already got a nominative, nominative there. It's the neuter pronoun, third, pers um, third person accusative singular, meaning it. Oh, we choose it because it's neuter. Uh, theoretically, if it, it could be a person, um, uh, a paideon, for example, a child who is an it, and in that case we might translate it as he or she, depending on whether it's male or female. But uh, for now, let's call it it because it's neuter. So Peter sent it. Then what have we got? Now, this is intriguing because I wasn't so sure about the way that Duff translated this in the back, but I'll tell you why I think he translated it his way and why you might want to translate it another way. Anyway, here goes. So, Peter sent it, ter ecclesia. Well, what's this? Well, ecclesia comes from ecclesia, um, the iota subscript distinguishing the dative case from the nominative singular case. So, ter ecclesia means something like to or for the church. So, Peter sent it to the church, or Peter sent it for the church. Now my instinct here, even without looking at this, uh, and especially after you've looked at this and you've realised what it is that is being sent, we'll come to that in a second, was to assume that it's being sent to the church. Um, the dative case can of course refer to being something being sent to or something being done to or said to a person. Duff has translated it for, and I wonder if what he's thinking is more commonly, if you want to indicate a physical thing that is being sent or given or uh, thrown to somebody, you might say it in a different way. Instead of using the dative, you might use uh, preposition pros plus the accusative. Um, instead of using the dative, you'd use pros plus the accusative. Um, I'm not sure whether that's the case. Um, uh, on reflection, maybe he's right and maybe he's making a subtle point here for um, us to pick up. Um, but either way, I mean lexically it could be to or for the church and there's far more to the dative than we're going to sort out here anyway but i'll just make, make you mention, make you aware of that if you wrote to the church i don't think you'd be wrong in a huge way but maybe for the church is better that's what a professor duff thinks okay so there's the main clause peter sent it to or for the church now here's the participle clause participial clause more accurately okay here it goes grapsas to biblion what's going on there well Where's the participle? It is, of course, this little baby. And um, it is grapsas, comes from grapho. Uh, let's just scribble that up here. Gra grapho. And here we're on yet another one of these uh, instances where the, the, in this case, the phi at the end of the stem is combined with a sigma to give a psi. Grapho has become gra sas graph sas uh, that's because you've got the sigma suffix for the aorist participle luon luontes lu sas aorist singular nominative masculine participle and there's the ending graph sas so this means because it's aorist we're going to translate it having and then whatever this means grapho means i write of course so having written 
So having written, Peter sent it to the church or for the church. Now, what's he written? Here, the whole point of this section, once again, the thing that he's written is the object of the participle. And it's to biblion, of course, the book. Just a note here, I think I've mentioned this before when talking about vocabulary. Um, books had only just been invented, really only just been invented, um, in the time that the New Testament was being written, and they weren't in widespread use. Um, whereas the word biblion was in widespread use, and very often it seems to refer to a scroll, not a book. There is a danger, slightly, of anachronism, uh, referring to a biblion uh, as a book, um, I prefer to call it a scroll, but I don't want to get in a huge debate about it. If you want to say book, book is fine. Um, but generally, more people would have seen scrolls than would have seen books, almost certainly in the first century. So having written the book, Peter sent it for the church, if you want to go with Duff, or to the church, if you want to go with hmm, uh, the other possible translation. So can you see what's going on? Once again, I'll switch colours, leave the environmental green, go back to the red. Um, having written is a participle in the same case, nominative, same gender and the same number as the, um, oh, what am I doing? as the subject, I put it down here because it's implied subject, as the subject which it is acting as a verbal adjective for. And it's telling you something not about the quality of the verbal, of the subject, but about what the subject is doing. And it's that he's having written and he has written a thing, the, the participle has got an object, the book. So having written the book, Peter sent it to the church. Okay, that's your lot. We've now got through almost to the end of chapter 7. Uh, just a reminder, uh, if you flip over the page, you find a whole juicy um, page 88 full of vocabulary. Uh, Greek becomes an absolute nightmare, however much grammar you know, if you don't know your vocab. Trust me on this one. Spend a couple of minutes a day, even if it's just a couple of minutes a day, just doing vocab. Five minutes a day and you'll nail it. But two minutes a day, it'll be well worthwhile. And go through your flashcards, go through whatever iPhone app or something you have to help you with the Greek vocab, um, because then it will make the whole process of reading so much more enjoyable. We will come back in the next video. Look at that last section in uh, 7.5, participles at noun, as nouns, do a couple of examples. And then off we go into chapter 8 and the muddy, murky waters of other patterns of nouns and verbs, which means that you need to keep going 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week if you want to be reading the New Testament in a year or two. Okay, God bless. Bye for now.